The Bright Spot for Health presents What are those funny white domes on hillside? Learn about the history of the center. Your presenters are Marilyn Landreth, M.A., and Hugh Reardon, M.D. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Can, is this close enough? The microphone? Okay. Uh, well, Marilyn has a uh, fine presentation. Anyway, welcome historians who uh, want to f- learn a little bit more about the history of the center. How many of you know what our what our symbol is, uh, jewelry-wise? Anybody? Better knows. Anybody else know what it is? Okay. Um, our, our symbol is the pearl, and that was suggested uh, uh, when we were starting by a fellow physician who was on the board of the American Holistic Medical Association at the same time I was, and he said we should choose the pearl as our symbol. If you can uh, see, I have I have a 20-year pin. Actually, I have a 25-year pin also, but this is the one I have on. Uh, our staff members get a pearl uh, for every five years they're here. So if you see somebody with uh, pearl uh, uh, pins, that's what's involved. But anyway, this doctor suggested that we should choose the pearl uh, as our symbol because we would be starting out as an irritant to the medical profession and become a thing of beauty. So as with the pearl, it starts out with an irritation in the oyster. Uh, we did the same thing, uh, probably, at least in the early days, and hopefully we become a, a thing of beauty. So uh, the pearl is our symbol uh, based on a good doctor's suggestion. It's worked out very well. So if you see somebody with four pearls, that means they've been here 20 years. If you see five, 25, there's a small number. Come in, whoever is trying to come in the door. Come on in. The food's in the back. Just one word about how we started. Uh, for a number of years, the uh, uh, entrepreneur group at the Wichita State University has asked me to speak about how we got started and what what our plans were. And uh, we um, started without a plan. Uh, a uh, Dr. Carl Pfeiffer, who is an MD, PhD from New Jersey, was in my office one day, and he and also uh, Bill Schull, who's a PhD, uh, who was writing uh, a book on medical advances for the Garvey Foundation. And for some reason, while we were together, Dr. Schull suggested we should go down and meet the executive for the Garvey Foundation, uh, which we did. And while we were there. Uh, The executive suggested we meet Olive Garvey, who was the uh, widowed head of the Garvey Empire. And while we were there for less than 10 minutes, Dr. Pfeiffer said out of the blue, uh, you ought to give Dr. Reardon some money to establish a nutrition research laboratory. And uh, there was no discussion. And uh, uh, Olive Garvey was a very prolific writer, and she gave us books that she had uh, written. Uh, the one she gave me was Producer Starve, a very good book. And uh, didn't think much about it. And two weeks later, the executive called and said, why don't you submit a grant application for that laboratory? You need to understand, we, we had not discussed this, so I called Carl Pfeiffer in New Jersey and asked him, what kind of laboratory is it I want? And he wanted uh, one similar to what he had developed, measuring trace minerals, and something called polyamines in people who were mentally uh, disturbed. Uh, So then I thought I'd better read the book that Mrs. Garvey had given me, uh, which I did. And I don't remember exactly now, but it's a page or a paragraph or a couple of sentences in which she said that in business, she did not think you should trust anyone with a beard. (laughs) So uh, rather than the usual 100-page proposal, uh, because I didn't think we had a chance of getting it. I did have suggestions that I shave my beard and things like that, but I don't do things like that. Um, so rather than the, the big uh, grant application, which I had done many in my past, that, you know, come back with many red lines on it about what you need to re- redo, I assumed Olive Garvey would be the final uh, viewer, and if she doesn't trust people with a beard, this didn't have much of a chance of flying. So I wrote a one-page handwritten message, 
which said, you don't know what I'm going to do, and I don't know what I'm going to do, but if you want to fund it, I'll devote three years of my life to making it work. Two weeks later, we had the underwriting funding established for the laboratory at the rate of $100,000 a year. I didn't learn until uh, a year later that Garvey Interest had tried to uh, support nutritional research in medical schools and universities, but were always turned down. You need to understand this was in the 1970s when no one was interested uh, in uh, nutrition. So, with that preamble, I'm going to turn this over to Marilyn. I think you've got your own microphone, right? And every now and then I might say something. Thanks very much. Well, thank you for coming today. And I didn't wear my pearl pin today, or you would have seen I have four of them on mine. Uh, I'm a year away from getting my fifth one. Well, when I, I first started working uh, on putting together a history of the center, it was kind of an overwhelming task. Although I've been here for many, many years, uh, to all the materials, and we have thousands of photographs, and. Dr. Reardon has done a really good job of keeping things, so we have a lot of uh, paperwork and all different kinds of things to go through to uh, put that together. But he said that's how the center started was with the words from Carl Pfeiffer that we should, that Mrs. Garvey should, the Garvey Foundation should fund Dr. Reardon in a laboratory like Carl Pfeiffer's. Well, at any time when I work on a history, I like to know more about the people involved. I mean, who was Hugh Reardon back in 1975-74? I mean, who was this man that Mrs. Garvey would uh, trust to put together a program like this? And why exactly was she interested in it? Well, Dr. Reardon was born in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We're not going to go all the way back to the beginning. But he had a rather an unusual background. His mother was part Russian and part French, and she had escaped Russia during the Revolution, uh, leaving all of her family behind, and uh, met Dr. Rudin's father in Japan. And they were in a, a huge earthquake over there, and both of them thought the other one had died. But they got together again, they got married in France and came to the United States, lived in Milwaukee, and uh, Dr. Reardon's father was also Hugh Reardon, and he was a professor at Marquette University. So uh, Dr. Reardon's mother had taught French and other languages in Japan. So he came from a very cosmopolitan family. He did have an older brother, Lee, and um, he was several years older than Dr. Reardon. This is Big Brother Lee and Dr. Reardon. And Lee played a, an important part in um, part of who Dr. Reardon is today. When he was a young boy, he was ill. And he was very sick for a long, long time. And the doctors tried to help him. And Dr. Reardon's father had read a, an article about sulfur. And he recommended to the doctors that maybe they would do this, give this to Lee. And they did, and he was up and going in a short time. Which kind of um, goes back to our co-learner way that we do here at the center. We really believe that people know a lot of information, maybe more than they know they know. So um, then Dr. Reardon found out later that that had been on the market for a while. This is Dr. Reardon with his mother, Tatiana. He had kind of an unusual childhood in that he didn't go to school until he was seven years old. Uh, but he'd had an area in, in the family pantry where he had his own little workshop and learned to do different things in there. There's his father's marine uniform on. And as a young man. Now, Dr. Reardon, his um, father was at Marquette University, and he could have gone to school free there, since it, during that time you could do that. But he was always a little bit different, and so he stayed out of school for a year, worked, and found out 
that that wasn't exactly what he wanted to do. So he did go to college, and then I, and right away from the beginning, he uh, went into the medical area. He um, he knew that the other work was not what he wanted to do, but he did work and pay his own way through school. And he was also the prom king, that's with his father and mother. This is his family um, on the far right is uh, his wife Jan. Next to her is his brother Lee. At the head of the table is his mother. And over to the side is his father and Lee's wife. And the two little boys are Neil and Michael. And I believe it was Teresa that was in the oven at that time. He was all scrubbed up and ready to go. And about the time, this is about the time, about 1975, and Dr. Ridden had finished his um, medical school in Wisconsin. He and some other uh, interns wrote to different hospitals asking what kind of program they had and, and um, just what they could uh, offer them. And the only one that answered was St. Francis Hospital. And so he did come to St. Francis and did his uh, internship there at St. Francis. Um, after he got through with his internship, he um, did a, a, his residency with Dr. Poling Fowler. And he had, Dr. Fowler was very interested in using vitamin B, uh, different kinds of vitamin B for psychiatric problems. So that was along with some of his medical school experience where Dr. Rudin had had a rat that, and all the other people in his class had a rat that they fed or did not feed certain nutrients to. And he found out that just depriving the animal of a certain nutrient would, um, it would lose its vitality. And some of them even died. And then by giving them the nutrient, it, they would again be a healthy animal. That played a part in his interests, and he had also attended the orthomolecular um, medical meeting in Canada, I believe, before that. So he had kind of a background already, and he also had helped with uh, Kent Frizzell's political campaign. So this was a man that was politically knowledgeable. He had run a psychiatric practice for many years, had a lot of people that he worked, that worked with under him, uh, psychologists, social workers, uh, counselors, all different kinds of uh, occupations. But he found out that was not really very interesting for him because he got where he was doing mainly administrative work and, he, and he, that was not exciting. So at the time uh, this started, he was still doing some private practice work. He had an art gallery in his office. Uh, and so at that point was where he met Mrs. Garvey. Now, as he said, Mrs. Garvey was, um, she was the head of the Garvey family. Her husband had died in 1959 and up to that point, all she had heard was like a one-sided telephone uh, conversation and she had also been the vice president on many of the boards that he had. So she was knowledgeable but she did not really take a part in the businesses. And then when he died, um, she took over as the head and ran that. But she also knew how to pick good people. And I think she did a very good job in picking Dr. Reardon. One of the things that Mrs. Garvey did was when she would pick somebody for a specific, specific position, she would let that person run that area by themselves. She would certainly be there as support and to ask questions, but it was their, their thing to take. Uh, one of the people that she hired at that time to help her with the... Um, money and keeping everything straight was Bob Page. Bob Page was both a lawyer and a, an accountant. And he helped with the Garvey uh, things. 
If you like to read more about the Garveys, I know several books. And as Dr. Reardon said, Mrs. Garvey was a prolific writer. She's very good at writing, and she's very interesting. So anyway, so we come to 1975, and Dr. Reardon has uh, his grant. And this is a time where Dr. Reardon says a lot of people, you promise according to your hopes and expectations that you perform according to your fears. And you know, it could be a rather fearful time having this money, uh, taking a path that was not popular at that time, going against the standard medical uh, area at that time. But this was a person who was able to take a different path um, that was excited about the path. You know, when they started up the laboratory, they had to, to start from scratch. The building was the one on uh, East uh, Douglas. It's across the street now from um, Clifton Square. The building, the machines, people to run the machines, um, even had to come up with the different forms and how to file insurance and and all of that. And Dr. Reardon is a very creative thinker, and sometimes the establishment does not think along the same lines that he does. Uh, so he um, he had come up with some ways that people could come in and have all of the testing done for a flat fee rather than each one of them specifically. And um, so that was a an area that they had to work on. They were talking about hiring a um, a person with a PhD that had some knowledge about nutrition, and they had not really uh, had done any advertising. And one day, Su Jin came in and said that she was a PhD in nutrition and wanted a job. So a lot, of, a lot of the times the things that have happened at the center have been kind of serendipitous and um, not really planned. Well, this is the lab, a lot of the lab equipment. The, a lot of the cabinets came from a hospital in Hutchinson. I think it was St. Anne's had closed down and they took the red pickup over to Hutchinson and um, brought the cabinets back. This is Sharon, Sharon Nethery. And Sharon is one of them that has five pearls on her pen. And Dr. Reardon was interested in the cytotoxic tests. And that is where you do a blood test to see if people have food sensitivities. And he knew that they had been doing this in St. Louis. So he called the Psychiatric Research Center there in St. Louis and, and asked uh, to speak to the doctor that was uh, in charge of that. And he was not available. He had gone on to a different job. So he asked to speak to someone who had some knowledge of that. So he was connected with Sharon. And Dr. Reardon asked her what she was doing. She said, I'm doing research, killing rats, and hating it. So she was ready for another challenge. And she came to Wichita and saw what was happening here and went back and then she did come and she has been here ever since. I think when she first came, if I'm correct, Dr. Rudin, uh, she was planning on being here for about a year. Because you have to realize that no one that came during that time had any um, guarantees that they would be around longer than the terms of that grant. So Sharon was one of the first people hired for the laboratory. Not the first, but several. Laura Benson came in um, just, I think, the same year that Sharon did. And she's our administrator. And she's another one that has the five-year, 25-year pen. This is our waiting room that we had over at 434 North Oliver. And it was, uh, when I came there as a student in 1978, I was, came in as what they called an extern. At that time, they, had, uh, they didn't have their uh, program where you could go out, the cooperative program where you could go out and work in a business and get credit for it. 
So they had come up with this one where you could go in and, and spend either the Christmas uh, holidays or um, the spring break and see if that was the kind of business you wanted to be in. So I had spent it at the center and it was a fascinating place. Of course, you have to realize I was getting an undergraduate degree in psychology and they were telling me all the things we couldn't do. And then I was sitting, coming over to the center and working with patients with Dr. Reardon or watching Dr. Reardon work with patients and saw some of the things that he was able to do. So this was built up on a platform and the um, file cabinets were around on both sides and there was a um, copy machine up there. And this was another part of the waiting room and I want you to know we're very frugal that couch is still here. <laughs> if any of you go down to our library, it's down in the library. So, And Dr. Rudin had a very interesting uh, office. That When I came in for my interview, uh, I had to go down this long hall, and then the, the office was kind of dark. There were just a few lights on, spotlight type things. And... Um, but over in the corner was a tree, or it looked like a tree growing out of the wall. He had all kinds of gadgets and toys in his office, not toys like children's toys, but adult uh, things to work with. Well, I better watch what I said on that. It wasn't exactly adult toys either. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an interesting, interesting office. So it was kind of fascinating going into there. Um, after the, the laboratory got started, uh, we also had, well, I should back up just a little bit. The laboratory was the first arm. The BioCenter laboratory was the first part that was developed on the center. And by doing the tests and different things that they did there, there was also um, a need to have doctors that would see the patients. Most of the people that came in to the laboratory were from out of town. Uh, so the second part that was started was the clinical services part. And we saw people who were two-day lab patients that would come in and spend two days with us. One day would be taken up with doing laboratory tests. Another day there would be different testing at the office and Dr. Reardon would see them. So it was kind of the forerunner for the way that we work with patients now. But then there was also a need for education. Because back in, in 1975, um, 76, there was not a lot of information. When you think about, think about what you were doing in 1976, 77. You know, most of us were um, not as knowledgeable as we are today. There was not the information surge like we have now, even without internet. So there was a need to educate both the professional and the lay public. So we, Dr. Rudin started the first international conference on human functioning. And this was held at Century 2. We had speakers come from uh, all over the world, not just from the United States. And the name of the, the education branch was the Biomedical Synergistics Institute. Later on, it was changed to uh, Biomedical Synergistics Education Institute, but at that time, it didn't have the education on it. If you can see the little um, logo on the side of it, and that's a heart and a um, wheat. And you can see it in the background, too. And it's um, the physician staff do no harm. One of the speakers that was at our conference was uh, Dr. Sharaskin, and he was a consultant here for many, many years. And I remember my first conference was in 1978, and it was really, there were a lot of people, there were a lot of interactions, people talking between um, workshops. And one night, we had a, uh, a dinner at Dr. Reardon's house, and Dr. Uh, Sharaskin asked me what I did. And I said, well, my job is getting Dr. Sharaskin articles because <laughs> I was kind of the gopher that went to the hospitals and WSU and got articles for the research department, which was one person plus Dr. Rudin. 
and he was very kind. Uh, Dr. Sharaskin has written hundreds of articles, and that's truthful. And he uh, sent all of them to us. So he kind of did me out of a job, actually. Uh, there were um, different vendors. And this is Irv Wilner. He was very kind to us. He uh, donated. He a lot of times would buy the book when we had the auction for the books uh, that people had signed at the conference. Dr. Dennis Burkett. He was from uh, England, and he was a very popular speaker. He talked about, uh, are you a sinker or floater? And he was talking about bowel movements. And that was always kind of an interesting one. Um, I taught a class at Fringe University for um, the center for a while. That was later on. And that was one of our topics for one of the classes. And um, it was amazing. The, the kids kind of snickered at first. But they were really interested in it. They said, you know, nobody really talks about something like that. So um, Dr. Burkett was a very interesting man. Somewhere in that time period, um, Dr. Reardon did away with uh, sick days. If you were sick, um, you did not, you would lose your day of um, work. But if you were well all month, you would get a half a day at the end of the month that you could take later on. So those were the well day um, incentives for the staff and that seemed to work very well. This is a racquetball court and part of the, our health incentives at one time we played racquetball every Tuesday afternoon, all of the staff did. And it was really a, a great time. We got to uh, bond and unbond in a few cases, but it was, it, I had never been very athletic, and my eye-hand coordination was really bad. But after playing racquetball a few times, it really improved. Another one of the things that uh, we did was the personal health control, and that was kind of one of kind of a research and a educational um, project combined. We had a thousand people from over the United States, but most of them were in Wichita. And it was a, a, where they would read things that we sent to them, and then they would respond back with what they had been doing. Are there any of you in here that was on the PHC program? A mm, couple. And the, one of the problems they thought with that was that there, all, of the, were, all of this was done through the mail. And um, they thought there were some things that we could do differently. But it was a good program. Part of it, this is our administrator, and she's using a pH paper to tell what her oral um, pH is, and that was part of the PHC program. Another program that we had was called One of a Kind, and that was a children's program that was on Channel 3, and it was. Uh, it was on for three falls, and I, they talked about uh, nutrition. They had songs about nutrition. Moore Anderson was a troubadour there in the back with the hat on, not the pointed hat, but the other one. And he came up with lots of neat uh, songs. That was the puppets. And this uh, Beth Snyder was the... Uh, Rainbow Lady in two of the, the uh, series that we had. Carla Burns was a clown and she sang in some of the uh, shows. Also one of the things that I thought was interesting was uh, if you know Carla Burns she has a uh, gap between her two front teeth. Well whenever they took the materials to the printer they had it fixed where you couldn't see the gap in her teeth. And she made them go back and put the gap in her teeth because she said, that's what I'm known for. And there's uh, Me Too, You Too, or the uh, robots and the tree. They had a, a booth over at the Wichita Mall and some of the staff people uh, manned that just to talk about the one of a kind. And uh, Donna is one of them there who is still a staff member. She's not been here 25 years, though. And the puppets again. 
It was Dr. Hugh was one of the puppets and the rainbow lady. That was the one of a kind show was done in the uh, early 80s. Uh, it was kind of uh, a way to kind of educate young people as to some of the things that, that could help them in their lives, positive attitudes as well as diet and exercise. And they had been talking ever since I started at the center in 1978 that we were going to build a new building out on North Hillside. And um, that sounded interesting, but um, I think there were a bunch of us that never thought it would happen. This is one of the early um, plots for it. There's all kinds of interesting things that was going to be here. This was the staff um, at the time before the building was built. And uh, I'm not in it, but I was a staff person. This is a model for the building. And it's, it's pretty much like, it's a little bit different, but there's still a lot of the things in it. Whenever most companies have a um, build a new building, they have a groundbreaking. But the center was different again. Uh, in that we had a sky breaking and we had on 1982 uh, July the 15th which was Mrs. Garvey's birthday we um, well the night before all the staff got together across the street at one of those storage buildings and we blew up balloons helium balloons and we they were put in U-Haul trucks and we were going to um, let the balloons escape. When you open the door, they were all going to come right out. This is the crowd at the, that we had that day. Back to the balloons, whenever we opened the door, they didn't come out. Because <laughs> when we blew them up, it was at night, and they got kind of cold in there, so they lost some of the, their bounce. So all of us had to, to jump into the truck and push balloons out. You can't tell that we're in there, but we are. It was kind of funny. There was kind of dead silence after the door was open. And we all kind of looked at each other, and then everybody reacted. There were tags put on the balloons that um, asked people to identify where they had been found and send them back to the center. And I forget, Dr. Rudin, do you remember where the furthest one came from? Illinois. Illinois. I was thinking that was it. So it was kind of interesting seeing the wind patterns. And the food, we had lots of food that day. This is the staff right after the buildings have, have started. As you can see, we've increased a little bit in numbers. And I think one of the things that happened was uh, we thought the building would be completed. We were told the building would be completed many, uh, well, months and even year before it was. And the staff was hired ahead of time because they thought they would be getting into this bigger building. And it was kind of a, a time of, well, it was still exciting, but we had, it was kind of crowded. That's what it was. <laughs> and when you came to work in the morning, you never knew whether you are going to get a chair or not. Usually the first person there got the chairs, and then you had to find one. And... We always joke that when we went on vacation, when we came back, we didn't have an office anymore because somebody else would have taken it. But it was still a fun time. Um, we were still playing racquetball. And um, whenever the building was being designed, the staff was fully involved in that. We had a meeting once a month anyway, and they would bring in different carpet samples, different things they were going to be using in the other areas. and. And so we were kind of kept up to date on what was happening and, and what was going to be used in the different areas. And then, the, then it got real exciting when they started putting the domes together. But you know what happened at the same time? We were a lot more visible than we had been when we were, were over on North Oliver. So we started hearing lots of weird rumors about us, which were not true. Something about the way the domes were made was supposed to be some kind of satanic messages or something. A little bit further along, 1983, we thought we would be in the building, but we were not. 
and we did have another celebration that year. It was Mrs. Garvey's 90th birthday, so we invited uh, a lot of people, and uh, many of her family was here, or a lot of her family. We're getting ready to move into the building. This is the next year, 1984. And I should say that, yes, we did have a lot of fun at work because we did uh, get to play racquetball, but we also worked hard, and we particularly did when we came out here because the grounds were so huge, and we helped clean up the building for moving in, swept it up, mop the floors. That's Shirley O.C. is really going at it. And uh, did a lot of work. And then for a few years, sometimes we even pulled weeds. This is the upper dome two of the maybe dome. Dome six. This is when it's not quite completed. This was a dedication ceremony that we had in 1984. We moved in in July of 1984. Well, it's actually the summer of 1984 because some of us moved in at different times. We had, uh, this is uh, Kramer Reed. He was one of the speakers at the, that day. Also, Bob Steffen is setting by Mrs. Garvey, and he was a speaker. This is Charles Berry. He was a, a consultant at the center for a while. He had been a the space doctor in the space program. He worked with one, one of a kind program, and he also worked with the uh, classes at Friends University. And you can see we have a little bit bigger crowd this year. Well, there are a few things that I, I didn't know how long I was going to be able to talk around my pictures. I always make fun of Dr. Ron. I tell him he has 10 pounds in a two-pound bag whenever he's going to do a lecture. And I had 20 pounds in mine, so I had to cut it down quite a bit. Um, the first grant was for the development of the uh, Biocenter Laboratory. And the first patient that they saw was in the fall in November of 1975. Dr. Reardon started in July of 1975, but they were not up and running. And actually, I think that they weren't quite planning to be up and running quite that fast, but they felt a need for it. And in the beginning, most of the patients that we saw were psychiatric patients. And there was the PHC program, and the sky breaking, and the first international conference was in the fall of 1977. Have you all got who the three staff people are? There's actually four. The one that I didn't mention was Mavis Schultz. She's our nurse, and she has been here for 25 years also. So Dr. Reardon, uh, Sharon, Laura, and Mavis have all been here 25 years. And it was the one-of-a-kind television program. And they're, re they're um, rewarded for well days. And the move to the new facility was in the summer of 1984. And I have to tell you about that move. We had told Dr. Reardon that we wanted it planned and organized and we wanted everything to work real smoothly. Well, we didn't know for sure when we were going to be in the building because we had to pass all these inspections and all of that. And I think we probably should have been the ones planning the move. Uh, one day, Dr. Reardon, twins, he has twin sons, and they came in and said, Dad says it's time to move the library. <laughs> So we loaded up the uh, red truck, and all of us kind of helped move things, and we moved the library over here. And that was the area that I was involved. By that time, I had my master's degree, and uh, I worked in the uh, setting up the library. And it was kind of interesting. I think they used Bob Page's uh, truck to move some of the... Um, equipment out of the laboratory. So we were actually doing a lot of things on the shoestring. But in, in a lot of ways, I think that was good because um, 
we were involved in it we were part of it it wasn't just like with our patients it's not that they come in and say I'm broke fix me it's that they're actually part of the process and giving information and receiving information so um, the center is uh, a great place to work it has a lot of challenges and I've certainly been challenged over the years um, but it's it's a vital active place with a lot of vital active people working here um, this year they're going to be able to have the opportunity to have some additional education there's always different programs for the staff to learn more and more so we're not just here as a body we actually are involved in it and we're part of this group so maybe you'd like to have the rest of your questions answered um, health incentives we have health incentives that different things each month sometimes it has to do with weight loss sometimes it has to do with drinking water um, and the one in May usually is taking part in the River Festival and most of the staff like the positive statements and on the uh, staff day of appreciation they're handed out to each one of the staff people so what we do in January as part of our incentive we have to write a positive statement about each one of the people that we work with and then that's put together and we get it in on the staff day of appreciation which this year is May the 17th and on the staff day of appreciation we appreciate the staff so we usually have breakfast somewhere have lunch here at the center and then something after work so it's it's a fun time uh, one of the pictures I wanted to show was of the one year at our staff day of appreciation we had uh, trumpeters out by the gate that played their horns as we came through which was kind of a fun thing in fact one of the ladies that got there before they got out there somebody told her that they were there so she drove out and drove back in just so she could have the things honk at her too or play there are a lot of things that I haven't mentioned there's um, the uh, Delta Sigma Gamma is the volunteer uh, part of the center and I think you saw the ladies here getting you drinks of water and setting up the room we have volunteers in many many different areas and the volunteer program had been started uh, when we were still at 434 North Oliver but it um, has grown and expanded since we've been out here at the center and they're always looking for good volunteers so if you know any another one of the things that we've done in the past are the health fairs we have those a lot of times in June uh, sometimes in the fall and sometimes we pick the day that is raining and we all get rained out um, but it's a lot of fun um, beat the odds that's the um, program at the center where if you're healthy and you want to stay that way maybe you have somebody in your family who has a chronic disease or cancer or heart disease and you don't want to do that beat the odds program is a uh, something to work with we also have uh, longevity longevity is rewarded here at the center and a lot of companies when you've been there a while they start wanting to um, replace you with somebody younger and that doesn't happen here at the center we're uh, recognized and honored for for sticking around so we have several who have been here 25 many at 20 with 15 5 and uh, some who are going to be there another thing that we had at the center that I thought was uh, a little bit different we've had center babies we've had different people who have worked at the center and they've been in a position where they could have their child at work so for about the first six months they would have their baby with them so we've had Megan Dylan Elizabeth Karen and Ashley have all been center babies and some of those are, are uh, I think Megan is 21 now so she was the first one and this year Health Hunter is celebrating 15 <coughs> years um, publishing and Richard Lewis at the back of the room is the publisher is the publisher he's the editor and we've also had 15 international conferences now 
And the 15th one was a kind of a grand return of many of the people who had, had been speakers there. The preceding program was produced by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International Incorporated and the Bright Spot for Health. For additional information concerning health or a listing of audio and videotapes dealing with health, visit the Bright Spot for Health website.